Welcome to church. If you are new, um, you may have picked up on the fact that we love Jesus around here. And, and we exist to exalt him. That is our one job as his church. We are kicking off a new series today called Divided No More. And our nation and even the church is divided over so many issues. And over the next few weeks, we want to take some time and talk through some of those things and, and talk about how as followers of Jesus, we should respond. And I want to challenge you to be here each week. Now, I can go ahead and tell you, I'll forewarn you, it's going to get a little uncomfortable sometimes, but I want to encourage you to not run from that. Because when we get out of our comfort zone, God does some of his greatest work in us and through us. So make sure you're here. Make a commitment. Bring someone with you. You know, we draw dividing lines when we disagree. And when we disagree, we choose sides, and those dividing lines become battle lines. And if, if we're going to know how to do this as followers of, tr of Christ, we need to look at his word. We need to understand our response. Because the reality is we're never going to agree on everything. That is an impossible expectation. And, and I want to uh, illustrate that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a statement and a series of statements, and I want you to raise your hand if you agree with the statement, and obviously if you don't, keep your hand down, and you have permission to look around because I want us to see how divided we can be. And these are not controversial topics, okay? So don't panic. All right. Pineapple belongs on pizza. Raise your hand if you agree. Okay, it's consistent, about 30% of you, okay? Some of y'all are like, yes, give me the pineapple. Dogs are better than cats. Okay, dogs win again. Now, that one could be controversial because I know cat people are really passionate, so don't, don't be upset and offended. Coke is better than Pepsi. Okay, it's about 50-50, all right. Dunkin' is better than Starbucks. All right, Starbucks is still winning. Starb now, we've got some really cool new coffee shops around here that could give those two a run for their money, so we might need to ask that question again. Texting is better than talking. All right, all right, we're seeing a little bit of a generational divide here. Um, TikTok is better than Facebook. Definite, definite generational divide. There's a few of you out there. I'm impressed. Some of you who are um, more seasoned in life threw your hand up. So um, that generational divide, that's what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But before we dive into that, I want to set up our series. Um, that, those were pretty easy issues to talk about, but there are some that are very destructive, some that are causing way more division in the church. And 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 13 will be home base for us during this series. And here's what it says. It says, I urge you, believers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in full agreement in what you say, and that there be no divisions or factions among you, but that you be perfectly united in your way of thinking and in your judgment about matters of faith. For I've been informed about you that there are quarrels and factions among you. Has Christ been divided into different parts? Certainly not. Now we just confirmed that we'll never agree on everything, and I think if that was our expectation, that would qualify us as a cult. And so that's not what we're going for. So what did Paul mean when he said, I urge you to be perfectly united in your way of thinking? How do we maintain and protect unity when we have disagreements and conflicts? Well, I came across a photo this week that I think is one option we could try. It might work. I mean, I think we could get some printed, really cool journey branding. And, and when people can't get along and they come to church, we'll make them sit together in the get-along shirt. Maybe. I don't know if it would work. But in our text, Paul heard that the church in Corinth was dividing into tribes. They were forming cliques around their favorite leader. Some of them were saying, well, I follow this leader, maybe because he's a better communicator. I follow this leader because he, he uh, agrees with my opinions and views. And they were creating division in the church. And so he writes this letter to tell them to stop fighting and to be perfectly united in their thinking. So if we know we aren't going to agree on everything, how can we be perfectly united in our thinking? Well, we can go to a passage in the book of Philippians that helps us understand what he meant. 
And in this passage, Paul was writing to another church, the church in Philippi, Philippi to address disunity there. So you'll see this theme because disunity and division has been a part of the human experience since the beginning of time. And so Paul is writing to them, and he says, Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This right here is the formula for how we get along, how we deal with disagreements and conflicts. How can we be perfectly united in our thinking? By having the mind of Christ. Like if you're a follower of Christ, I'm a follower of Christ, and, and even if we disagree, if we have the mind of Christ, there's a way to work through this. If we strive to think like Jesus and be like Jesus, we can ad addre address disagreements and remain unified. And we still may not see things eye to eye, but if we have the mind of Christ, we won't hold grudges. We won't slander each other. Jesus didn't demand his way. He was the perfect example of selfless humility. He valued others above himself. If we disagree and we have the mind of Christ, we should be able to address it without destroying each other and dividing the church. And when we hold grudges and we gossip and, and we try to get people on our side, we think we're standing our ground. We think we're proving our point, and ultimately we're hurting the body of Christ. We are damaging the cause of Jesus. So we don't have to agree on every detail of life. We don't even have to agree on every detail of the scriptures because some of them can be interpreted differently and seen from different angles. But there are some things that are not up for debate. There are some truths that are not open for interpretation. These are the non-negotiables of our Christian faith. One, salvation in Christ alone, by faith alone, and not of works. Jesus is the only way to God. The Bible is inspired by God and without error. Jesus is God. He is fully God. He was fully man, and he is the second person of the Trinity. He physically lived, died, and rose again, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and one day he is coming back physically for his church. Those things are not up for debate. We don't get to fight over those things. But if we disagree on something that can be interpreted differently, we should be able to do it in a way that we don't destroy each other. Romans 12, 18 says, Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. I can't do your part. You can't do my part. I can't, I can't change how you respond, and you can't change how I respond, but I am responsible for me, and you are responsible for you. And if we're followers of Christ, the Word of God says we need to do everything in our power to live at peace with everyone. Conflict and disagreements are inevitable, but we have a responsibility to maintain, protect, and restore unity. So how do we move past disagreements? We focus on the things that bring us together, and I think there are two main things that bring us together, a common enemy and a common mission. See, I believe Satan is laughing and celebrating right now, because two of his greatest tactics are division and distraction, and he is winning in the church. He is winning in our nation, division and distraction. When we let secondary issues distract us from our primary mission and divide us into tribes and cliques, we forfeit the power of God and our influence in this world. And I'm going to say that again because I think it's so important as we enter 2024. When we let secondary issues distract us from our primary mission and divide us into tribes and cliques, we forfeit the power of God and our influence in this world. John 17, verse 20, Jesus prayed. He said, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's us. And I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Jesus prayed that his church would be united so that the world would believe in him. One of our greatest evangelistic strategies is our unity. That's why the enemy is coming after that. That's why the enemy wants to divide us. I was reading an article this week about how unified the nation of Ukraine is since being invaded by Russia. And prior, to, prior to the war, there was division. The Russian-speaking citizens were opposed to the Ukrainian-speaking citizens because they still had some loyalty to their Russian heritage. 
But since the invasion and destruction of their country, their loyalty has shifted to Ukraine because they've now seen the true intent of Russia's leadership. They are united around a common enemy who is trying to destroy their lives. You and I have a common enemy who is trying to destroy our lives. Ephesians 6 verse 11 says, Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Paul said we're not fighting with each other. Our battle is not with each other. And it goes on to say that our fight is against a dark and unseen world. Spiritual warfare is real. The enemy wants to keep you focused on the temporary, visible things of this world, but spiritual warfare is real, and we fight it on our knees and with God's Word. And if we're distracted from that, then we are going to be open game for the enemy in our lives, in our homes, in our churches. Satan distracts us from the real battle that we should be fighting for our marriages, for our homes, for our children, for the church. For those coming behind us and ultimately for the souls of people who need to know Jesus. This call to unity is not a call to be passive. It is a call to place our passion in the right place and to fight for the right things. Isaiah 117 says, learn to do what is good. Seek justice, correct the oppressor, defend the rights of the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Make God's priorities your priorities. So we have a common enemy and it's not each other. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you're not my enemy. Some of y'all needed to say that to your spouse today. <laughs> we have a common enemy, and we have a common mission that brings us together. Our mission is to love God, love people, and make disciples. And this mission is based on the great commandment and the great commission. This, this is not something we came up with. Matthew 22, verse 37 says, You must love the Lord your God. These are the words of Jesus. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. This is the first and greatest commandment. God is teaching me that if I will love him ultimately, that if I will love him with all my heart, soul, and mind, vertically, then all the horizontal junk I'm dealing with with other people can be resolved. He has to be our first love. He has to be our ultimate love. And then he goes on to say a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. In other words, everything in Scripture points to those two things. Jesus said, love your neighbors, and then he took it a step further in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. He said, love your enemies. Love those, bless those who curse you, do good to them, and pray for them. Love God, love people, even your enemies, even those who disagree with you. And then in some of his final words to his disciples, he said, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the mission of the church. Make disciples of all different kinds of people. Reach out to them, teach them, baptize them. John 13, verse 34, again, Jesus repeats this over and over through his ministry. He said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. When a group of diverse people come together from different religious backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnicities, faith stories, when people come together and they not only get along, but they work together, they love each other, they build God's kingdom together, the world will pay attention to that. The world will notice. But instead, what they see right now is people who call themselves Christians forming tribes and cliques around their ideologies and their stances. And when they see that, they do not see Jesus. So if we're going to have the mindset of Christ, we have to grow up in our faith because we aren't born knowing how to do this. We are born with a, a selfish, self-centered tendency. And so we have to grow up in our faith if we're going to be like Jesus. And if we want to be like Jesus, we have to be with him through reading the Bible, through prayer, relationships with other Christians. Hebrews 10.24 says we should consider ways to motivate one another to love and good works, not neglecting meeting together. That is why the church is so important. Growth track groups coming to worship together that is vital if we're going to grow up and be like jesus today i want to 
talk to you about a dividing line that I think has serious consequences for the future of the church, and it is the division between young and old. See, the enemy has divided us along generational lines. The younger generations believe that those of us who are more seasoned, I refuse to say old, but those of us who are more seasoned in life don't understand what the world is like right now. That our experiences are irrelevant. We just don't get it. And those of us who are older tend to look at the younger generations and say, well, they're just disrespectful and ungrateful and entitled. And it creates this division because we don't understand each other. And we're not willing to, to get close enough and, and try to understand each other. And we do that to our own detriment and to the detriment of the church. The United States is currently populated by six generations. And here's what I want to do. I'm going to call out a generation, a time frame. If you were born during that time frame, I want you to stand. It was really awesome. In our first worship experience, all six were represented in this room. So if you were born between 1925 and 1945, would you stand to your feet? This generation is known as the silent generation. And I'm not sure, I didn't research why they were labeled that, but it kind of broke my heart because we need their voices. We don't need them to be silent. If you were born between 1946 and 1964, would you stand to your feet? 1946 to 1964. Yeah, this is the boomer generation. So awesome. Okay, my generation, Generation X, 1965 to 1979. Anybody in the room? 1965 to 1979. Yes. My people. 1980 to 1994, the millennials. Millennials represent. Wow, that's a lot. That is so cool. I love it. I love it. All right, 1995 to 2012. Generation Z, look at you guys. Generation Z, that were y'all supposed to be the last, like, I don't know why they named you Generation Z. All right, so we're starting back over because the next generation is Generation Alpha, these sweet, sweet babies. Kids born after 2013 and will be born before 2025. We had a couple in the room last time. Anybody? There's one back, right back there. They are. Oh, I love it. I love it. Six generations with very different life and cultural experiences. I mean, think about the changes that someone born in the 1920s and 30s has seen in their lifetime. They grew up um, during World War II. Their formative years were during that time, some of them, and, and were spent in one of the biggest international conflicts in our history. And then to think about fast-forwarding through their life and every generation who's come behind them, there have been multiple wars, assassinations, the civil rights movement, the tech revolution, mass shootings, the Great Recession, 9-11, COVID-19. I mean, all of these things have an impact on each generation. And, and depending on your financial status and your race, you experience those things very differently from others. And so having conversations to learn how that impacted us is so important. Experts believe the era you grew up in has more influence on your personality, attitudes, and priorities than the family you were born into. Think about that. Psalm 3311 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Every generation has been shaped and formed by the significant events that they've experienced. But the one thing that spans time, that spans all generations, is God's plan and his word. It never becomes irrelevant. It never is outdated. And that is what we come to. That is the place where we land. And so I want to talk for just a minute to the younger generations, maybe millennials and younger. And know that this is coming from a heart of love. Because it's easy to look at those who've gone before you and see where we've missed it, see where we've been closed-minded. And you may not realize that whatever advantages you have in life, Whatever advantages you have in the church and in following Jesus, you have those because of the people who went before you. You are standing on the shoulders of people who went before you. And I encourage you to not forget that. When we came back to Nassau County to start the journey, we knew that we were going to be very different from most churches in this area. We had a dream and a vision to do church in a new and a different way. And sometimes new and different can be misunderstood. And so in those early years, people were not so certain about us, and 
some of the more established churches and people who attended there began to start rumors about us and, and try to minimize what God was doing. And, and so as God was moving and we were growing and lives were being changed, people would say, well, they're growing because they don't teach God's word or they're growing because they just tell people what they want to hear. Um, and this was the best one, the rumor that we worship aliens. We worship aliens and that because our auditorium is dark, we actually worship Satan. So um, my personal response, this was not right. My personal response was to get defensive and to ridicule how they were stuck in their ways and unwilling to change. And one day I was out shopping in our community and, and God ordained a moment. I was in TJ Maxx. And I ran, ran into a pastor's wife who um, is from our community, and she came over and she said, hey, we've heard all that God is doing in the journey. And her next statement changed my heart. She said, what you're seeing God do in your church is the result of years of prayers prayed by people who came before you. And that was such a humbling moment for me. Because any success we have in ministry, really, I think any success we have in life is the result of people who've labored and toiled before us. And we need to remember that. Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. So don't discount the experience and wisdom of those going before you. Don't let differences of opinion drive you away from the people who are older than you. Because what they've experienced might actually help you. Immaturity says that your parents and your grandparents don't know anything. They're, they're outdated. They can't, they don't understand. Whether it's about life, church, or politics. But maturity says, I have blind spots too. And I have a lot to learn. And so let's approach that from a place of growing and maturity. Now, Gen X and older, that's me. Everybody older than me, we're not off the hook. In case inside you were cheering, we need to be challenged. Can we admit that we don't know at all? Sometimes we think because we've lived life and, and we've done a few things right that we have all the answers and we need to, to admit that we don't know at all. Everything wasn't better back in the day. You know, we think it was, it really wasn't. We have to be open to what the younger generations are trying to tell us about engaging our culture. We need to listen to them and pay attention to what God is doing in this time at this point in history and stop wishing for the good old days. If what we're building depends on us and only pleases us, it will crumble when we're gone. We need to pay attention. We need to ask ourselves, if we're holding on too tightly to the way we've always done things, and by doing that, we're pushing the next generation away. We can't compromise truth and we can't jeopardize the gospel, but we might need to burn some sacred cows. We have an amazing, and we have, we have an amazing group of seasoned Christians in this church. I mean, you saw that the various generations represented here. In fact, I would say we are where we are today, and we are um, doing what God wants to do and through us because of that generation, because of their generosity and their willingness to serve and their sacrifice. And if you want to know their level of sacrifice, show up on a Tuesday, show up any morning of the week at 5 a.m. when they're jumping in a truck to go pick up groceries for our food ministry. They don't retire. A lot of them had jobs and retired from their jobs, and they just kept doing ministry because we don't retire in the kingdom. When we did, we're retired. We get to rest. According to Ephesians 4, 16, we know that Jesus tore down any dividing lines of hostility. He tore down the dividing lines between young and old. And when we have the mind of Christ, we can be set free from bias and prejudice, when you see somebody young, maybe they're not dressed the way you think they should be dressed or their hair doesn't look the way you think it should look, you immediately pass a judgment on them and you don't know them, you haven't had a conversation with them. But God wants to set us free from the bias. If you're young and you see somebody old and you think, yeah, they don't know anything, God wants to set you free from that. Through humility and love and the power of the Holy Spirit. And it starts by asking God to help us see people as he sees people. If we see people the way God sees people through his eyes, created in his image, it'll change everything. And this is vital because I believe the future of the church depends on this. Judges 2.7 says, And the Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua, and the leaders who outlived him, those who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. I believe this is a warning for us. 
The Fuller Youth Institute has done extensive research on what they call sticky faith, trying to answer the question, what keeps kids actively living out their faith after high school? Because more than 50% of students leave the church and walk away from their faith as they enter college. To find out why this is happening, they did a six-year study, and they discovered that one of the most important things that anchored kids to church and to their faith was intergenerational relationships. And they explained that it's more than just multiple generations being in proximity to each other. What made the most impact was when two or more different generations came together in mutual influential relationships, working together to reach common goals. Translation. When different generations are serving together and building the kingdom together and doing life together and learning together, it will anchor our next generation to their faith and to the church. Acts 2.17 says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. God says he will pour out his spirit on young and old, sons and daughters. We have seen that in this church. We saw young people on the stage leading worship, young people serving with their children. Young people are a vital part of what God is doing. God is pouring out his spirit on them, and we need to be ready to equip them and empower them, not discount and minimize them. We need to listen to their ideas and trust them with opportunities. We need to serve shoulder to shoulder with them and build the kingdom together. Pastor Oscar Murillo is a pastor, a leader in a church in Nairobi, and he has a school of leadership that is constantly producing young men and women who are stepping into their calling and their purpose. And here's his strategy. Everyone should be pouring into someone who's 20 years younger than them. That is his strategy, and his church is producing leaders in exponential numbers. We have to prioritize God's kingdom and his mission. Every generation prioritizing, prioritizing God's kingdom and his mission. Let me, I, I want to ask you a question. Do you want a healthy and thriving church for your children and your grandchildren? Do you want that? Because it's not just going to happen. It's going to happen when we are willing to invest time and resources. If we are willing to build something that will be here for future generations. Because we're not, I'm not going to be here forever. Those my age and, and older, we're not going to be here forever. And this thing's not going to click autopilot and just keep going. It's going to take all of us doing our part. And here's the thing. If church isn't really important to you now, if it's minimally important to you now, it's probably not going to be important at all to your children. The level of commitment and passion you have for the body of Christ translates to your children. They're watching My mother made great cornbread dressing, and she made it for every holiday. And as she was getting older and, and her health was declining, I knew I needed to learn how to make this because I wanted to be able to pass that on. And, and she could have just handed me the recipe, right? Here's the recipe, and I'll go do it. But I knew I needed more than that. I needed to be in the kitchen with her. I needed her showing me what to do because even though she had a recipe, she didn't exactly follow that. you got to put a little more of this and a little more of that. And I had to watch her. I had to be in there with her. And then when I started to make it, she had to watch me and correct me, and, and she even let me make some suggestions that made it a little better. And that's what we need. We need to be in this together across generational lines, learning from each other. We just come in and we sit here, and, and we're not in the trenches together. We're not preparing the next generation to take the baton. We need to be doing this together so that the next generation knows what to do, how to do it, and do it even better. That's the goal. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example. Be an example to all believers in what you say and the way you live in your love, your faith, and your purity. Younger generations, we need you. We need you stepping into leadership, learning to be leaders, leading small groups and Bible studies, investing in children and students. We need you to realize that your life is about building God's kingdom and not yours. We need you. And that's why we offer intergenerational groups like Growth Track and, and our men's groups and women's groups. They're, they're intergenerational. Men's fraternity, all of those things are there to help us accomplish this. But we have to show up and we have to make the commitment. So I want to ask you a question. What are you going to do this year to intentionally connect across generational lines? What are you going to do to ensure other generations are represented in your life? 
And here's how I want to close. I'm going to invite two of my friends to come up and, and pray for us. Dalton Cruz and Dr. Des Amanu. Dalton has been a part of the journey since sixth grade. He started attending in our student ministry, and now he is leading in our student ministry. He's completed all three of our leadership courses. He's a sophomore at University of North Florida in Jacksonville, and he lives on campus there, but he drives back every Wednesday to help with student ministry and every Sunday to be here to worship with his church family. And I have asked him to pray for the generations who have, come, uh, who have gone before him. And then Dr. Desamanu is from Ethiopia and has a doctorate in ministry, and he's written two books about his life, and they're powerful. Such a powerful story. God has brought him through things that only God's grace could sustain him through. And I encourage you to, to talk with him because he has so much knowledge. He loves discipleship. I see him up here during the week meeting one-on-one -on -one with men, just pouring into them. And then sometimes you walk around this building and you might find him just in a corner tucked away somewhere praying, walking the parking lot praying. And, and, and so I'm going to ask him to pray for the generations that are coming behind him. And I've asked both of them to pray for the unity of the church, to pray against division and disunity. So guys, you come on. And Dalton, I'm going to ask you to pray first. And then Dr. Des, you'll pray after that. Miss Kara, for such a great and powerful message this morning. So let us pray. Dear God, I thank you for this day, Lord, and God, I want to come to you and pray for the ones that have gone before me, Lord. God, I thank you for their faithfulness. I thank you for their devotion to living for you, God, so that the ones coming behind them may see and grow from it, Lord, that we may learn how to love and live like you, Lord, and to pass it on for generations to come and to keep the mission going, God, because you are the most important things that our life will ever have. And God, as we enter 2024, Lord, there's so much opportunity for us. So I pray for unity among our church. I pray that we are stronger than ever. God, I pray that we aren't divided by the things of this world that don't have place in eternity, but that we may be united in your word, God, and in your truth. So God, I thank you for the ones that have gone before me, Lord. I thank you for the impact they've had on me and for many more to come. God, we thank you and we love you so very much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. reverence to God. Lord God, we thank you for giving us this opportunity today to be in your holy presence. We come to you, Lord God, asking you to invite us to your throne, to be in love with one another, Love that is agape love. The love that is self-sacrificial. That is selfless. Father God, I pray that everyone's spiritual heart be sprinkled with the love of agape nature so that each and every one loves the other as better than ourselves. Father God, your word in Galatians 3.28 declares that there is no longer Jew or Gentile or slave or free or man or female. You, we are all one in Jesus Christ. Let us be one in Jesus Christ and love one another because Lord God has given us one greatest commandment followed by another greatest commandment. The first greatest commandment the Lord Jesus Christ gave us is about loving God, loving God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. This is in all the Synoptic Gospels. In Matthew 22, 
37 to 40. In Luke chapter 10, verse 27. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30 to 31. Each gospel authors who are inspired by God to write his word exactly as he said have given us this to follow and loving our brothers and sisters. All those in created in the image of God are also considered to be the second greatest love. May you, Father God, plant in every chamber of the heart of all who are in the body of Christ here, near, far, and all over the nations. I pray that all nations everywhere receive this blessing. May everyone receive your blessing. I ask all this in the holy name of Lord Jesus Christ. All who believe say amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. So grateful for him. Thankful for these guys. We love you all so much. Uh, I just encourage you to stop at Next Steps, to, to get signed up for growth track groups, get connected. If you need prayer, we have deacons in uh, the care room available to pray with you. And again, make sure you're here next week. Bring someone with you. We love you. Have an awesome week, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>